Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Let's ask that you please stand. Join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our worship this morning in song. Precious Lord, thank you so much for the beautiful day, the beautiful week that we've had, Father. We just are so thankful for the change of the seasons and the warm weather that has brought us. Father, as we worship you together this morning, may we just praise you for being the creator of this wonderful place that we live, this wonderful universe that we have, and be the creator of our son, Jesus, in whose precious name I pray, amen. There's women in my heart a memory. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's heaven flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. those around you, good morning. Mm. Justin, Justin, wait on. Water you turn. There's no one 
So I got a buddy, Colin Willis, out there every week. He likes to tell me his favorite song. He says, this week, I Will Rise is his favorite song. I have a, uh, I have a couple friends that really like this song. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anger for my soul I can say it is well i
Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Solomon stated there, Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what God has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Some time ago, there was a tree that was in a forest. The tree was crooked. Its roots grew up out of the ground. Its branches nearly sagged to the ground itself, a very crooked tree. As a tree considered itself, it looked around to the other trees in the garden or in the forest there, and they were tall and straight, beautiful trees. And it wished so much to be like the other trees along the way. And they... Uh, God heard the prayer of the tree to be straight and tall and sent a messenger, an angel. And this is what the angel said. It said, consider the work of God who can make, who makes straight and what he has made crooked. Consider God. Days later, a lumberjack headed into the forest and he saw a gold mine in trees. These beautiful, tall, straight trees. And before too long, he had wiped out the complete forest. All trees but one, the crooked tree. And it was at that point the tree thanked God for being what he was, different than the others around them. This morning, I get to share with you part of my journey. Jared passed away some time ago now, July the 19th, 2020. It's a date emblazoned in my mind. I don't forget it. Oftentimes, remove it out of my mind for a period of time, but it's always within grasp. It's always within touch. If you don't know who Jared was, he was Angie and my son. Part of what I'm sharing with you today is the impetus of this message. It it, it is part of the conclusion I have walked through in that process of grief and that journey into things that I never wanted to experience, but that's where I am in life. I'm not speaking for anybody else on uh, this topic But I'm just sharing with you what I think the scriptures teach on this idea of when life is bent or twisted or crooked. How do we handle it? What do we do? And so if you take a Bible in hand, I'd appreciate it. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And again, I said this writing is a man by the name of Solomon. Supposedly in Scripture, he is given credit with being the wisest man that ever lived by the power of God. And this word crooked or bent or twisted occurs 26 times in the Scriptures. Fifteen of those times occur in the writing of Solomon, whether it be in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or one of the other books. So it's a word that's not uncommon in use by any stretch of the imagination, And we're going to look at that idea this morning of what that means, but let's pray as we start. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your holy scriptures. They give us guidance, they give us wisdom, and they give us something real to hold on to in this world. You tell us in the scriptures that these words are eternal. They're important. They guide our lives. I pray, Father, that you bless the reading of your word this morning and your people that have gathered and those that are watching as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the verses I just shared with you at the beginning. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what God has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider... God has made as one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. Now, the word crooked or bent or twisted occurs first in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now, turn with me there. There we were in Ecclesiastes. It's hard to say Ephesians and Ecclesiastes. They run together on me. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Turn with me there. It's the very first time the word occurs. And again, in the writing of Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12. 
I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study, to explore by wisdom all the thing, all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Now, I love the Word of God. I've dedicated my life to the study of it and the preaching of it. But I will tell you very honestly, if you've read through the Scriptures, if you read from Genesis to Revelation, there's probably books that pop out in your mind that you enjoy reading more than others. Some of you may enjoy Psalms or James or Proverbs or whatever it might be. I'm sure each of you have your favorite books. Probably one of my least favorite readings is the book of Ecclesiastes, to be completely honest with you. It's a rather pessimistic view of life. It's a rather dismal view of life. And this comes from the wisest man, supposedly, that ever lived. Now, I don't say that to malign the Word of God because I truly do love everything I read in the Scripture. But there are some parts that I'm more drawn to, the sections on hope and the, the, the sections on about heaven and the, so, the, the sections about how we receive salvation. I, I'm drawn to those things. But Solomon lived his life, and he viewed life from a different perspective. And he uses several words that are parallel words, like life is a chasing after the wind. Life is a vanity. Life is meaningless. It's twisted. They're all parallel terms for what he's trying to get his message across. And as he looked at life, he looked at how he fit into the plans of God. And that's what I want to consider this morning as we look at these things. But the reality is, is I've lived my life, not just from the passing of my son and the other losses that many of you have lost in your life or, or walked through as well, the trials. The realistic view is life is twisted and it is crooked and it has been at times. So as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, what do I do? How do I handle that? So I look to the scriptures for those answers. Now, there are bent and twisted and crooked examples that we find in the Scriptures. One of the earliest ones I can think of is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 15. Turn with me there, if you would, there. Abraham and Sarah there. Genesis, chapter 15. And as I say that, let's remember what Solomon said. God allows the twisted and the bent in our lives. Genesis chapter 15, God had made a promise to a man by the name of Abraham. Hey, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham waited and waited and waited, and there was no son. So Abraham laid a plan out with Sarah. But he addresses God in this section of Scripture. It says in Genesis chapter 15, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. He's saying, you know, Abraham, I blessed your life, and Abraham's still waiting for a son. But Abraham said, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since that I am childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be an heir. Do you see what he's asking God? He said, God, this has kind of been, it's twisted, it's crooked. You, you, you promised me an heir. You promised me someone that would inherit all these things, and yet you've not fulfilled your promise yet. God had worked all this out up to this point. There's other examples of bent and twisted and crooked times in people's lives. There was a, by, a guy by the name of Naaman. He's a general of the armies of Assyria. They're really enemies of God. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he had leper. He was a leper or was leprous. So here is this fellow that's a non-Jew. He's a Gentile. And the Lord had blessed his life. And in the process, he had leprosy. That's rather twisted and bent, doesn't it? He's got blessing from God, but not removed of the leprosy. And there's another fellow in the New Testament by the name of the Apostle Paul. First Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn with me there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
You will not find a more dedicated servant than the Apostle Paul. He loved God, was willing to suffer, willing to die for the cause of Christianity. And he had a conversation with Christ one time that's only recorded here, interesting enough. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting there at verse 7, Paul writes this at the end of this letter, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, Paul would receive visions and revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight my weakness in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That seems rather twisted or bent or crooked, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul, one of the most dedicated servants of God, willing to literally travel the world, the Roman world at the time, to take the message of Jesus Christ, baptize numerous people, and yet he pleads to God, God, remove this thorn from my flesh. And God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. So I ask you this morning, as you have lived your life, you have had bent and twisted and crooked things happen. What do you do? How do you handle them? What do we do when life is bent and twisted and crooked? Now, I have no doubt those that have gathered here this morning, those watching on Facebook or YouTube or wherever it might be, I know that you love the Lord. You listen to him diligently. You, many of you read his word on a regular basis and you pray to him for guidance and, and looking at life. And we're people of faith. And God's a major part of that. We, be, we believe God loves us unconditionally. He'd have to because he knows everything about us. We believe that God works good out in our lives. The promise of Romans 8, 28, 8. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Many of us have memorized that verse. We believe it wholeheartedly. There's not a doubt about it. But often when we're dealt with this tension, God loves me unconditionally and he wants nothing good for me, but there's bent and crooked and twisted things in life. What's going to be our response? You know people, and maybe you've experienced this yourself personally because of this wrestling. The human response in times is sometimes doubt that God is real, that God it really is the good and benevolent, loving God that he is. Or we doubt even there is a God at all because there are those that we run into that don't believe there's a God at all. At one time, they were in the faith. But because of life being bent and twisted and crooked, They've been challenged. Fear or anger can creep into us and we not feel protected by God and we oftentimes become upset and angry. I will not lie to you and tell you I have not asked God why Jared is no longer here. As some of you have asked that question, why did this thing happen or why, what's going on with this situation? You're trying to figure it out and try to understand it. God can handle your questions. His shoulders are big enough. Ecclesiastes, verses 13 through 15, kind of answer those questions for us. There are things in life that are straight and easy, and those are good days. And there's things that are crooked and difficult, and they're horrible days. But God allows them both. That's a hard thing to accept sometimes. In life, there are days of joy and there are days of adversity. Hear me, church. God allows them both. There is righteousness and good doing going on around us all the time. And there is wickedness and evil doing. God allows them both into our lives. We can feel let down by God when bad things happen to us. Because maybe something that we've not done at all. But because of sinful mistakes others have made or maybe mistakes that we've made along the way as well. 
And if we're honest with ourselves, we expect hardship or trial or discipline from God when we sin. If, if I do something that's wrong, I can expect to be disciplined. That's what my parents did when I was young. Don't touch that. You do. You'll be disciplined. Understandably so. But when, when I'm doing what is right, when I'm doing what is faithful, when I'm doing what is true, and there's hardship, we wonder why. God, I'm doing what you want, aren't I? But God allows them into our lives. When we become a Christian, you and I not only say to Jesus, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him as my Savior. We know those words. And, and, and we can accept Christ as my Savior because you know what? It's what we're getting out of it. I, I'm, my sins are being taken away. Praise God. I'm being offered the promise of heaven. Praise God. I, I'm being offered blessing on this earth. I get a church family. Those are the things that the Savior does. And man, I love that part of it. That's the part of the story I'm drawn to. But when I accept him as my Savior, I also accept him as my Lord. Here, church is where the rubber meets the road. Most of us are in it for what we can get out of it. But when it starts to cost us, that's where it gets a little bit harder. You see, to confess Jesus as Lord, it means he's my king. And whatever he says or does is right. That's hard. Dallas Willard wrote this, and I think this is interesting. Faith in God is not just believing that he exists. Faith in God is believing that he is right. Let me say that again. Faith in God is not just believing he exists. Faith in God is believing that he is right. And I will add to that, no matter what. That's a hard thing to accept. In order for the process of life to properly walk into a situation that is so difficult can be incredibly hard. But when I call him my king, God, whatever you do is right. Solomon observes in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13, that in life there are straight and easy things and there are difficult things. God allows them both and he allows the crooked and he is right in what he does so that it may benefit me. Ecclesiastes 7, 14, Solomon observes that in life there are days of joy and there are days of adversity. God allows them both in our lives. And he is right to allow those things to happen so that we know in eternity what is best for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 15. That in life there is righteousness, there is wickedness and evil doing. God allows them both into our lives and at some point will make them all right. You see, Paul sees this, his weakness is where he is strongest. It's when God comes through. He believes God is right and perseveres in faith. Solomon writes all these things, looks at life. Towards the end of the book, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he comes to a conclusion. And this is what he says. The end, the end of the matter is this. All has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. There's a lot of different things that we could talk about theologically we believe about God. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it comes down to being obedient to the one that's called us into the light. No matter what. That's not always easy to say. Lee Strobel, in the case for faith, wrote this. If faith has never encounters doubt... If truth never struggles with error, if good never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? In my own pilgrimage, if I have to choose between the faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink, or a naive faith 
that has never known the firing line of doubt, I will choose the former every time. He's saying that sometimes as we live life, as we're faithful, there's times of questions. There's a testing of our faith. And what will we do with that? I titled the message this this morning, Following God No Matter What. I will not tell you that is an easy path. I will not tell you that is an easy road. It is an incredibly difficult path. And it is not for the faint of heart. And for those that live faithfully. Angie and I were walking a day or so ago. And I was told her, we talk about the church a lot, obviously. It's, it's a major part of who we are. And, I, and we were discussing this thing. And I, I, I said, there's no place I'd rather be than here. I love being at Central. I feel like I can be what God has called me to be here with this group of people. And I love that. And that's a major part of who we are. And as we were talking about those things, we were talking about things that we go through. And then we got to talking about the leaders of the church here, the elders particularly. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. And I'm not divulging anything that some of you may not know. In the last year and a half, each of our elders has faced crooked, bent situations. Heartbreaking. And I will tell you, Their faithfulness has inspired me. Their continued belief that God is still king, that he is still ruler, and he is their Lord no matter what. And as I look at the congregation, there are a lot of you that are in here in the last year and a half have gone through a lot or maybe in your lifetime you have just suffered through difficult circumstances that are bent and twisted and crooked and they're not right and they're just heartbreaking but yet you are faithful and I praise God for you because at the end of the day as you consider all those things the duty of man is to live for God and believe he knows best and that's the only thing we can rest on Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us the strength that you do. You are our Savior, and we thank you. You are our King, no matter what. You are always right. Sometimes life doesn't make very much sense, and it is bent and twisted and crooked but you're always there, and we thank you. I pray that you bless your body here. As we move into a time of decision, may you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning, please? If you're here this morning and you're in Christ, I'm very thankful for that. But if you're here this morning and you're not, I invite you to come forward this morning. As I said before, following him is not easy but I don't know any other answer to this life. I think of the words of John. I think it's in chapter 6. Jesus said, you know what? You need to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And the disciples departed. And Jesus looked at the apostles. He says, will you depart from me? And Peter said this great line. He said, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of life. That's what I'm asking you to come to is life today. Let's sing together.
1 Corinthians, the Bible says this. For the message of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. People respond to the cross in di different ways. Some ridicule it, some ignore it. Some Christians have turned it into just an item of beauty or a gold adornment that they hang on the wall instead of what it really is, an instrument of torture. The cross was a, de was a device for executing the death penalty in the worst way possible. But the cross and Christ crucified was the substance of Paul's preaching. And for us who are gathered this morning, we don't look at the cross as just something we hang around our neck or something that we put on the wall up front. No. We look to the cross as a symbol of God's power. God's power in that it was there at the cross that our Lord was crucified that we could re receive forgiveness and mercy. It was there at the cross and Christ crucified that we are re redeemed, that we can be reconciled back to God. It was there. And so we meet now to take of the Lord's Supper to remember Christ and him crucified because we know there is the power of God for our salvation. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your holy name this morning. We praise you because you are God of love and you reached out to us wanting to give us mercy and forgiveness through Christ and him crucified. And so we thank you for this opportunity to remember him, to remember what he did for us, the extreme price that was paid. And so we thank you for this bread and this cup by which we remember our Savior and our Lord. And through him we pray, amen.
been a good day to be with you. I would ask you to stand if you would. Just a couple of things before we dismiss. Uh, Graduate Sunday is going to be May the 29th. I have three names thus far, Mariah Cook, Zach Stafford, and also Hannah Shavers. Uh, those are the ones I know of. Uh, if you know somebody else that's graduating that is, attends church here or part of church here, let me know because we want to recognize them on the 29th of May. Also, uh, a lot of announcements in the back of the bulletin, mainly dealing with lot, our youth and children. Uh, sign up for Vacation Bible School is still out in the vestibule on this side. Please sign up for that. Uh, VBS is always a lot of fun, a lot of work, but uh, I encourage you to sign up for that. And lastly, Donna Stevenson's birthday is today. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Happy birthday, Donna. I hope you enjoy your day today. Uh, any other announcements, anything? Uh, I just want to make, mention, too, uh, this past week we've had a lot of activity at the church. Uh, Monday we had a leadership meeting. We had the Boy Scouts in here the scouts in here and they were very active uh then uh let's see i'm trying to remember uh there was a lot of different events and my memory just went that quickly did that ever happen to you any of you guys wednesday we had uh kinder music happen here and then yesterday just real quick mention uh Central had the honor of hosting a preacher encouragement seminar. We had several preachers here, and I got an email from one that said, uh, boy, you have a wonderful place to host people. So I appreciate y'all being participating with that, whether you knew it or not. Uh, But it was was a good day for that too. So anyway, let's pray before we dismiss. God in heaven, I thank you for uh, your blessing. I pray that as we depart, that you'll be with each. Father, give us strength for the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Shine upon